Hello and welcome, Luke Turvey. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for agreeing to doing this interview for Cafe with the News. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. So, uh, Luke, you are a lover of writing and the unlimited power of creativity. Uh, you spent some time as a sea cadet and you are a power boating and sail instructor. You are a fan of gaming and you are a gamer yourself. You are a fan of space and music. You like to spend some time alone creating something new. You are also the author of uh, sci-fi, space opera, Amethyst. I have it over here on Kindle. I read it. It's pretty fantastic. And we will dive into it. And you published via Paper True. And the Amethyst is also available on Amazon as a hard copy as well. Did I miss something, Luke? Uh, no, that sounds honestly... Uh... Awesome. Like, it's a great introduction. Uh, you know, there's a lot there. So, It was really interesting that there was a lo lots of, let's say, lingo. Is that connected to you being a sea cadet? Uh, yeah, a big part of it, especially because, you know, with space, you have like the Navy, right? Just kind of the classic style for space ships and stuff like that. Um, very themed off of my naval experience. I was going to go into the Navy. Um, that was kind of what I was training for after I became a sea cadet, which I did for seven or eight years and worked my way up. Like I became the coxswain of my course. I was like the senior cadet. So it played a huge part, you know, like being on the bridge of a ship. I have experienced that myself. You know, I've sat in the helm of a real, uh, you know, Navy ship, um, been on the bridge doing lookout. So definitely was big inspiration for it. And, you know, the lingo as well. Um, and then, you know, I was, I've watched you know, military movies since I was a kid. And so I just, I wanted to take some of like, you know, the best things from everything and kind of combine it into a different world and have a different take. But uh, let's start with the first question. So look, Amethyst yeah. is a sci-fi opera full of action and battles. H how do you find writing so many battle scenes? Because I, I don't think I've read a book with so many battles and with so many action scenes, the one you wrote. So how do you find it? Honestly, I was really worried that it was going to be too much for a lot of people, um, especially, you know, sci-fi is popular among, you know, people that love sci-fi, getting other people interested in it, which is where, you know, the personal side of things kicks in as well. But uh, honestly, it was, it was really concerning for me. And it was, you know, I was very nervous and uh, adding too much, making it, you know, not necessarily too realistic, but maybe too gritty um, and too graphic, but I really wanted to capture the essence of war. And that's kind of what a big inspiration was for me is showing like how brutal warfare really is and that it's not just, you know, one battle here and one battle there. It's like the galaxy is at war. Um, and it was hard to write too, because you don't want to repeat the same exact thing every single time, right? So, you know, every... You know, spaceship battle, you want it to be somewhat different, so it's not just a you know, copy and paste. Um, and yeah, I just, I really wanted to show that the, the galaxy was at war, and no matter where you went, you were potentially getting caught in warfare. Whether you were a soldier, a civilian, didn't matter, right? Uh, the war was everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was challenging to write, for sure, but, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun, and, you know, I tried to give it a different spin to what you would normally see. I feel like, you know, at least myself, I do feel like it's quite different from most media you would watch or read or experience, so. But it was a lot of work, for sure. Definitely a lot of revisions going through each chapter. And I think you've done an amazing job, that's for sure. I, like I Thank said, I, <laughs> I've, I've never read a book with, with so many battles in it, and... It almost reminded me of uh, Black Hawk Down. If you, mm. I don't, yeah, so it was pretty action packed. So my question for you is: um, obviously, you must have done a lo loads of research, and uh, most likely you've drawn from your own experiences as, as a sea cadet too. What would be your advice to someone who doesn't have your experience or doesn't do as much research as as you do? So writers, let's say, they want to write battles to action scenes as well. So what would be your advice to them? Honestly, my advice would be, like, you can do simple research. So you can watch just something on YouTube, which is what I'm doing right now with my prequel, um, because it's a lot of uh, boot camp, because it's going back to one of the characters' origins. 
and I'm just watching boot camp training videos, getting an understanding of, and it, it, you know, you can watch it. It takes 10 minutes sometimes, right? Just to do a quick thing. So a YouTube video here and there. And if you're wanting to watch or uh, to write battles, just watch a war movie and take similar elements and turn them into sci-fi, right? So you can have mechs and lasers and stuff like that instead of what you would see in World War II, a tank or whatever. And because, I mean, towards the end of the book, um, it's very World War I themed with trench warfare. Um, and so that's right. I drew that inspiration from, I mean, to me, I think that when you think of World War I, you think of just a valley of death, really, right? And I wanted to try and capture the, the horrors that that was. So you just draw from other elements and then just add your specific, you know, genre into it. You just kind of blend the two. Um, but that that's the best way, in my opinion, is just to, you know, watch a movie and or a couple movies and take three things you really love from those movies and combine them into, you know, one different thing with a blend of your own element. So uh, you mentioned that earlier that you try to make the action scenes different, that uh, it was a bit... A bit of a challenge. So, how did you um, solve this issue? That's honestly a good question. Uh, the easiest way to do that, I guess, uh, dare I say easy, because it's a lot of work in itself, but uh, trying to find a way that you add your character's individual dynamics into it is really important. So, like how they're going to handle that scenario, which later on in the story I do, where I split my characters up because their dynamic is always being together. I don't know, just giving them a different purpose is part of it. One of the elements that I used, or I, you know, I think is something I enjoyed with my own writing, is I tried to give it a bit more grounded and realistic feel in a sci-fi. You know, like the spaceships, uh, you know, there's scenes where in space they can move around, they could be upside down, you don't really notice, but when they're in atmosphere, even just turning the ship, if it's an aggressive turn, people can start falling over, and you don't really see that in sci-fis, at least not very often. So I really wanted to try and add that element of realism. Or, you know, if you watch Star Wars, uh, you know, a ship can take off from atmosphere, and they just kind of zoom up into space, and it's a one-second transition, and they're flying off. And I wanted to be like, no, more realistically, the ships, they, they have these rocket boosters. They, it's a more aggressive launch to orbit, sort of like modern-day rocket ships, right? So a bit more of a grounded, realistic feel is kind of what I was doing to give it a bit of a different feel for a sci-fi. And then the, I guess the base plot is in itself kind of unique. And honestly, the base plot of Amethyst, Cyrell, and Vander, um, that actually happened by accident. That was not the original story. They got added into uh, the story much later, just by a series of events. And a friend actually helped me come up with that. Yeah, there is definitely loads of realism, it's, uh, and not just in the dialogues, which uh, the dialogues are absolutely brilliant, um, but there's also loads of realism when the characters are trying to solve certain situations. If you look back writing Amethyst, um, what was the biggest issue, if you will, with writing the action scenes? Consistency, honestly. Um... Especially when I wrote the book, I wrote the beginning, and then I wrote the end. Uh, not the final chapter, but the end battle. So basically when, you know, they finally, you know, get to Earth and the battle that takes place there. That was actually the second part that I wrote. And tr I didn't really know necessarily what was going to get them to that point yet. The whole middle wasn't written. And uh, so I was kind of, I mean, with writing, a lot of the time you're just improvising. And every sentence while I was writing that was kind of improv, right? And sometimes I didn't really know where I was going with it. And then I would change things. Uh, and then you'd have to go back and you'd have to um, change this and change that. And this character is no longer there. Or this character is in a different spot now. And so the consistency was hard. I mean, that's just writing as a whole. But uh, with the combat, you know, it can get quite complicated with which character has which weapon, you know, how much ammo do they have? Who are they with? Um, you know, what injuries do they have? Because, you know, if a character has an injury, and I, that was actually one of my biggest mistakes when I went to editing the first time, was my editor caught that. He said, hey, this character has an injury early on in the book. And I didn't necessarily neglect it, but I didn't really showcase it. Um, so that that's one hard part is an injury, is how does a character actually react 
with a leg injury or an arm injury, you know, they're not going to be functioning at 100%. Um, so the consistency with, you know, you know, what weapons they have and things like that was honestly the most difficult. And I had it written down, like, step by step, what character had what equipment and what their their state was. So that, that was honestly quite a challenge, especially with the chaos of everything going on. Having a notebook beside you that has everything written down, I got it all the time right now with my prequel it's the same thing like i've got you know dozens i probably have thousands of pages of side information and stuff written down and i've got a little whiteboard that i keep next to me so as i do things i can wipe it off after i've changed it but notes for yourself is probably the number one most important thing because you can always forget in the moment but you look at your list of things that you need to do and revisions and you know information that you need and I keep that next to me at all times when I'm writing, just a notebook and a whiteboard. So uh, without giving too much about the story, um, the the main, let's say, story is that uh, there's a fight between uh, United Forces and Rebels, and there are some yeah. neutral systems too. It almost felt like a civil war in a way to me. How much did you draw from contemporary society? How much were you influenced by current political situations around the world? Actually quite a bit, and this is part that's not in the story, so it's not really too much of a spoiler. Um, although in the story, it's mentioned that, you know, the main characters aren't really necessarily sure who the good guys really are. Like, is the Alliance the good guys? Do we really want to go through with this mission? Um, and that perspective kind of changes through over time as they've, you know, worked with them a bit more. But the larger point of that story is, you know, when you're just a small person in a big world, you don't really know, like, is your country as good as you perceive it to be? Or, you know, is, if you're fighting a war, is your side on the right side? Or is, is there a right side, right? You know, I kind of leave that for the reader to explore for themselves as well, even though there is a yes or no answer to this uh, in the background and actually how the war started, because it's not in the story, it's only ever speculated on. Um, I've got a full thing written on it, exactly how it happened. And it was originally um, a very political event that, you know, just led to people getting short fused and it escalated, right? And originally, because there was an actual civil war, on the, uh, the enemy's home world, right? Which it does mention. After that civil war ended, the Alliance had basically been blockading them. I think sort of, I guess, like, you know, in Star Wars with the, uh, the Federation blockading Naboo, right? Kind of a big blockade, only, you know, much bigger. It was that restriction where they were keeping that civil war at bay on their own world that led them to resent the Alliance for not letting civilians escape because basically it was a restricted area no one was allowed on or off. It kind of draws to the real world events that we have, right? We, we blockade each other and it's all this stuff. We're not actually engaged in warfare necessarily all the time, but you're manipulating, you know, that region or that country or that planet, whatever, right? There's not really a good guy or a bad guy. There's worse guys, but, you know, their mistakes were made on all fronts and it led to, you know, an escalation, basically. There are some... Um questionable acts done by uh, both sides, obviously. How, how did you feel writing this brutal and devious acts done by the, these sides? It was, it was interesting to write and it was hard to write because I think about how it would be to be in those people's shoes. The grief that would come with doing something that you believe is the only option you have left. It would be like firing nukes nowadays, right? Where it's kind of a total destruction and you're thinking, it's us or them. I think most people understand that decision on smaller scales, right? Like it's a me versus someone else and I've got to take care of myself or my children or my family. And this is the same kind of thing, but on just a massive and horrific scale. You know, when they've seen the devastation that this enemy has done to innocent people as well, they go, you know, we've got no options left. It's, it's torch and burn. It was a challenge to write because I wanted to make it, again, sort of realistic. It's not just a they go in and do whatever they want and walk out completely unscathed and with no remorse, right? I wanted it to be a bit more humanized and show that, you know, even the people making the decisions while they're doubling down and standing with the decisions, not an easy decision for them to have made. Uh, and that goes even to the politics towards the end of the book, where it still is a ongoing discussion with the government and with the different factions, basically saying, like, 
it's not, you know, we have got to do things better and differently and we can't go down that same path again. You know, trying to make it so that the, the future looks more positive, even though the past is horrific. Let's focus now on the uh, uh, fact that you publish on Amazon. Uh, how did you find the process? I worked with Paper True doing all that kind of stuff. They did a lot of work for me. They actually even set it up on Amazon for me. That was, you know, part of their system. Um, it was costly. Everyone that knows me in real life knows that I've talked about how much, you know, money it does cost to go through that whole process. It's expensive because um, I had them do a lot of work. Setting up on Amazon was quite easy because they they literally did everything. They set up the books. They set up the account. They did I never even used Amazon myself to buy stuff, right? So like they set everything up for me. The only thing I will say is, this is my mistake anyways, but I didn't really ask enough questions when they were setting it up. So going at it alone now has been much more difficult. Like I'm trying to navigate the system myself and I find it very complicated, inconvenient to try and find how many sales I've made. Like I actually don't know the number. The last I checked, I think it was 60 something or 70 something on Amazon. Um, but you have to have like a connected seller central account. And honestly, I find it quite complicated and having them linked and um, going at it alone. I, I should have asked more questions had I known, like looking back and I would say to anyone else that ever does it, definitely ask how you check that kind of stuff because I didn't and I've been left to figure it out for myself. It's been an ongoing challenge. I mean, it's, I published in June of 2023 and here we are in February of 2024, and I still have no idea, you know, really how to navigate it. So it's a complicated process when you're trying to do it yourself, for sure. Well, are there any uh, other questions that you should you should have asked? Number one, uh, how do I, you know, link the two accounts, the Seller Central with the, the other one? Um, how do I purchase author copies? Because I've done it before, but now I'm not even seeing the option, so I don't even know how to get back to it. So I can buy the, you know, the the manufacturing cost version and sell them physically, which I'm doing because I actually work at a store and we do sell my book there. And then another question would be like, how do I actually check my sales numbers? I, you know, I'm sitting here, people ask me how many have I sold? And I'm like, I don't really honestly know the total number, right? So that's honestly the biggest one is just how to navigate that. And another one is how to adjust. Um, if I make a revision on the book, like I've got you probably saw some of them, some spelling mistakes and uh, some errors in the book. And of course, I've gone and fixed them now, but I'm not really sure how to go and fix that on the actual version. Is it going to cost me money or is it not? Um, which I don't think it does. It's a question I should have asked, like how easy and how do I go and, you know, swap the old version for a new revised version? If you went back in time, would you proceed in the same way or would you um, you know ask more questions or would you do something completely different oh 100 percent. i would do everything the same minus those little mistakes not knowing of course what the future holds and what questions you're going to have but yeah i would do everything the exact same you know the money was worth it you know they made a beautiful cover because they did the cover for me they set up the book wonderfully and all of their help setting it up on amazon was wonderful. I just, the only thing I would do differently was ask different questions, ask for a little bit more guidance on uh, how to make those changes for myself in the future when I'm at it by myself. Uh, but everything else, I would 100% do exactly the same. And with my next books, I probably will do it pretty much the exact same. Another issue uh, lots of writers uh, deal with is marketing, obviously. Lots of, uh, lots of writers are rather yeah. introverted and they just, they, we like to write the books, right? We like to talk about our books. Uh, but some of us, uh, maybe perhaps most of us, we don't really like to sell our books. So how do you yourself find marketing your own book? Honestly, it's a challenge. You know, like you said, we're very introverted and I would consider myself an extreme introvert. Even, even in my day-to-day -day work, uh, talking with people, I work in customer service and it's excruciating, honestly. Um, you know, it's, it's always a challenge, but uh, marketing it is very difficult because even, you know, I, I know every ounce and inch of this book, but people ask me like, oh, what's your book about? And I like panic, right? Because I'm like, oh God, how do I explain it in a way that someone that's maybe not into sci-fi is going to understand it? Because I can't just read off what it says on the back of the book, right? So I, I try and explain it. And I swear, I explain it probably different every single time. And I feel like I'm a kid in front of a classroom doing a book report, right? I'm like nervous and 
you know, I, I feel like I'm going to be judged, which, I mean, I probably make myself judged by being worried about it, right? But uh, yeah, so it is hard to market it. Uh, the easiest way of marketing it so far I've found was honestly how we met was through Night Cafe and, you know, posting AI digital art and, you know, creating little scenes from my book and doing that. That's honestly given me probably the most publicity I've had since I started. And, you know, I've seen other people that have said like in that on comments saying like, hey, I'll go check out your book and like, I want to read it or whatever, right? So that's that's been the easiest marketing. And since I've been using that art um, just on my Facebook, which I have on public, um, just to try and get more reach, I feel like I've probably sold more books through that AI art, you know, publicity than anything else, minus my Discord, which I have, there's 750 people there, right? So, you know, that's, that's a lot of traction. Um, and just meeting more people, which is hard right that's a challenge but you know being in the inspired writers group and things like that like just finding any avenue where i can do it outside of face to face is honestly been the easiest because trying to do that stuff in person is honestly very hard so basically as much um uh, media and you know digital publicity as possible and i know i'm gonna have to you know bite the bullet eventually and take the step and maybe do some more things. My my sister has a business and she goes to these little, you know, fairs and sells her product there. And she's much more social than I am. So that works for her. And I've been thinking about it since she's been doing it, which is longer than I've been published. It's, it's terrifying to even think about actually doing it, but I'm going to have to do it eventually. And hopefully I can make some sales there too. Just get my name out in the area here. I really liked what you said about using AI. It's a, a little bit emotional, loaded topic, uh, AI, using AI, especially AI art. It was interesting when you said that it really helped you just uh, using pictures created by the AI and just writing about uh, your book, snippets from, your, from the story. So what would be your advice to someone who's been playing with this idea using AI, but, you know, still they are on the fence? So what, what's your take on that? In my opinion, like, I, I try not to think too much into it. You know, I, I'm going to utilize what tools I can. And, you know, as long as you're not breaching any contracts or copyrights, which Night Cafe says, like, anything you make on that app with the, their AI, like, you're entitled to use as long as it's not copywritten on some other third-party plat third party platform, right? Um, so I try not to really think about it, like, even if I'm making something that could cross those boundaries. Like I'm not stressing about it because it's nothing's really official. Like I'm not, I'm just using it for um, like a casual publicity. Nothing is like, this is my character or this is like, I say, this is like a concept of, you know, my story. Um, so I try and walk the line and, you know, I'm sure I could go and get something copywritten and get some rights to things if it's, you know, not a problem. And then I could actually officially use some of it because some of it I would love to. It's a tool to be used right now. And I know AI in itself has its own controversies, but I would say with the AI art, you know, I'm not claiming I'm an artist. I openly admit I can barely draw a stick man. So, you know, I'm not trying to ever take it and say like, this is my art and I did all this work. Like I say, like I use AI art and, you know, I openly advertise that. And then I just use it as concept art to help me with inspiration mostly. So look, if you imagine a writer who really doesn't want to meet any people and who prefers to stay in, in their basement writing their book, you know, not meeting anyone, and you would tell him, listen, you don't have to meet anyone, but you can promote your book just with uh, the AI uh, images, just with the AI creation. So what would be your suggestions for the steps they should take? For me, just making that art would be a great decision. You know, going in and doing it for yourself, because honestly, I didn't publish my first set of things. I would say, go in, tinker around with it. You don't have to publish it. You don't have to involve yourself with the community. Like, just do it for yourself and inspire yourself with images and scenes and even creating scenes from my existing book. Seeing it kind of come to life a little bit really inspired me to want to make more. It made my book feel a little bit more real for myself, even though it's not going to feel any more real to anyone more than it will myself but uh 
you know, seeing those images come to life can be extremely inspiring. So, you know, if you have a friend, like my brother's an artist, um, you know, if you've got a friend or a family member who's good at art, ask them to do it, you pay them to do it. That's totally fine. Um, Cause it is a lot of work and time for them doing something that lets you see your book come to life is honestly probably the most inspiring way to get yourself to write some more and really buckle down for it because you know, you, you feel like that world's a little bit more real when you're seeing something as opposed to just, you know, playing it in your head. Yeah, it just probably is the best direction. Get something physical, have some sort of art. Even if it's a sketch and it's poorly done, just having a direction for that is definitely the best first step. Speaking of AI, what do you think about ChatGPT or Gemini by Google? Uh, do you think that these uh, AI tools will one day replace writers? That the AI will write books that are better than, than you know, books written by people? I guess the possibility is there. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it could ever replace writers because writers will, like AI will generally draw from something that already exists and maybe it can take it in a completely different direction. But I think the human mind is more capable probably of creating something that doesn't exist uh something totally brand new and you know maybe we can't think of anything off the top of our heads what that could be but someone down the road might but yeah i think i think it's one of those 50 50 things like it'll definitely probably be used by writers um to help give them a direction with something or you know movies honestly probably would be the big one you know movie writers could probably use that a lot and it could honestly probably help write huge parts of movies. Um, I've heard that's kind of a thing that people are talking about. But yeah, I don't think it could ever replace, you know, the traditional writer just because, I mean, A, there's so many people that do it, whether it's professionally or casually. The passion with it, I think writers will always be passionate enough to come up with something brand new and unique and exciting and share it with the world and share amongst each other. Um, even just look at, you know, the inspired writer group that we've got, um, you know, we, you see so much inspiration and excitement with people that are there, whether they're published or not. And maybe some people will never publish their work, but they will always have those stories that they can share. And, uh, I think that will be a thing forever. Look, what do you like most about your own book? I would say, I want to say the characters, um, but honestly, it's the world, I think, that I've created. Uh, there's so much that's not really in the book that I'm going to be expanding on through more novels within the series. But um, it's it's the world I've built. Uh, it's the backgrounds to uh, every world, every faction. You know, I've got a lot of planets. There's 42 of them. Some are inhabitable, some aren't. Getting to explore those different worlds is honestly, I think, my favorite part. And I don't really dive too deep into it with this book, but there are a couple worlds that I do explore, right? And getting to create and experience those worlds, you know, Malroot with glowing red trees, you know, just these different environments, and Vexus with this jungle storm world, just experiencing the different planets and ecosystems and environments was honestly probably my favorite part because each one of them was inspired from a different place for me. And some of them were, you know, like uh, Vexus with the jungle storm world was actually inspired from a true event that took place for me. And uh, there's a character with uh, a near-death experience involving the waves there. Uh, that was an actual real experience that I had myself uh, during a big storm. And we were on the side of a cliff and I almost got sucked off this cliff by a giant rogue wave. And uh, the story itself is almost unbelievable. But, you know, that inspiration, that, that moment was probably one of the most important parts of my life. And it gave me a, quite a different perspective on, you know, how fast things can change or how close, you know, you could be to a, a bad circumstance at any moment of your life. But yeah, definitely creating these different worlds. And I, I look forward to writing more worlds in the future, you know, diving more into different societies and environments and everything in the future. So this is my favorite part is just exploring worlds that don't exist. That's probably my favorite part is just seeing the different worlds and bringing them to life. What do you love most about writing in general? Drawing from real life 
experiences. Um, I have had a couple near-death experiences, so uh, I understand, you know, the feeling of being in those panicked situations and having to, you know, get get through it and, you know, deal with it. Uh, and, you know, no matter how scared you are, sometimes that adrenaline kicks in and you don't really think about it. You just kind of pull through. Uh, but, yeah, for me, writing, the best part about writing is just exploring um, whether it's, you know, published in the book or, you know, I've got dozens upon dozens of short stories that I've written that will never be published and never be shared. But it's just for myself, explore new things and get emotions out too, right? Like I can draw or uh, I can draw from like an emotion of anger if I'm having a really rough time with my life or sadness and write a story themed to those emotions and just see how they come out. And it's therapeutic, which I would say is probably the most important thing with my writing. It's for me, it's not about making money it's not about publishing books it's about having something that i love and that makes me happy and that's the the biggest part there is something that makes you happy because not everyone has that and especially it's something that you can do for free whenever you want and it's it's my mental therapy honestly get my emotions out and you know get the creative side of my brain Luke, what would be your message to someone who is not writing yet, but they are thinking about it and it just, but they, you know, there's too many books already. I'm not good enough. I'm never going to succeed. I'm never going to be able to sell my books. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. So what would be your message to, to these people? I would say just do it because it's something you want to do. And, you know, I never intended on publishing a book. Amethyst did not start as a novel. It didn't start even being titled Amethyst, and the characters Amethyst van der Seyrel, which the main characters of the plot, didn't even exist for probably three years of me writing this. And you never know where your story is going to go, so you just write because you want to write. And if you really enjoy it, keep going. And if it becomes something, it becomes something. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, you know, maybe it's just you decide it's not for yourself. The most important thing is just if you want to do it, do it for yourself and to tell a story you want to tell. And what comes from that is, you know, to be determined with the future, really. There's no way to know for sure if you're going to make a book or not. Because um, I sure as hell did not ever think that I was going to be an author. I just loved writing. And so I just kept writing. What a beautiful message. Thank you for that look. We are mm -hmm. at the end of our interview. Is there anything else you would like to tell our viewers at this point? It's that that's that social awkwardness where I'm put on the spot and I have to think of something for myself that uh, that I struggle with. But uh, if you're passionate about something, pursue it. Whether it's you know writing, gaming, drawing, sports, whatever it is, take the step, do it, and you can always stop if it's not something you end up enjoying. Every person's different, and sometimes it's hard to know what it is that you really like but if you don't have something that you're truly passionate about you know try new things for sure you know that's that's the scary part of life we've all been there had to take a leap if you are interested in something you should try it yeah i'd be happy to do a reading um i've got my book here ready to go um i haven't read in a long time since like high school so it's been years uh so it'll probably be a little awkward i i don't read out loud ever um, but I've chosen a chapter here, chapter 12, uh, for a couple reasons. One, it was just enjoyable to write, uh, this and the scenes that it led into were some of my favorite in the story. Uh, but the main reason here is actually because it gets two of my main characters, uh, in here by name. And they're the two names that everyone gets wrong the most, uh, so far everyone I've talked to has mispronounced their names. So... I figured I would get both of their names in here, and that way people can actually hear what it's intended to be, and uh, that way they can read it uh, a little easier in the future. So uh, I guess I'll start going. The light above the door turned yellow, signaling to stand by. She quickly threw her hair into a ponytail and then wrapped it into a messy bun. One minute, she said with an exhale. There was a hiss and a pop, followed by the doors sliding open to reveal the world outside. The roaring sound of the thrusters drowned out the sound inside as the doors fully opened. It was morning, and the golden sun was peeking over the large jungle horizon behind them. This helped keep their ship out of sight from the village in the distance towards the ocean. 
As Cyrell and Vess approached the door from opposite sides of the troop bay, they grabbed onto safety handles. Leaning out, they could see the massive jungle below them. The canopy of trees whipped by quickly as the ship scooted low over them. Eventually, the river appeared below, and the ship piloted by Veronica slowed down. When we hit the deck, Cyrell yelled over the background thrust. I'll watch 12, you get 6, got it? Yeah, Vess yelled back while also signaling a thumbs up. The ship lowered directly over the waterfall, stopping next to it. The light turned green, making Cyrell give Vess a nod. They both jumped out together, landing with a crunch. Vess hit, executing a forward somersault and aiming her rifle towards the trees. Clear, she yelled as the ship lifted away, blowing sand and leaves into a brief miniature tornado. Clear here, Cyrell also replied. They both snapped their rifles across their chests and moved for the cliff. I'm heading back to orbit. When I get there, I'll lock on to your signal. Good luck, Veronica radioed to them as the ship continued upward. Vess aimed over the edge, scanning the ravine below. Clear, she said, this time quietly. She swung her rifle over her shoulder and climbed down. Cyrell crouched, constantly shifting his position to watch behind and below. When they had made it down a few meters, Cyrell clipped his rifle to his shoulder sling and placed it along his side before joining Vess in her slippery descent. Minutes later, he reached the bottom. His boots hit the ground with a thud, and when he turned, he saw Vess watching the tree line. Her rifle was still slung across her chest, but she watched intently. Time is not going to be our ally, she said in a quiet tone. Sounds of the jungle faded in as Cyrell stepped away from the pouring waterfall. Birds and other creatures squawked and screamed in the distance. Let's get a move on then, he replied, pulling his rifle to his front. He dropped slowly. Um, so yeah, that's a little section there that I decided to read. Um, hopefully that's Good. Hopefully everyone enjoys it. And uh, yeah, we'll continue. You go now online, you go to Amazon, and you buy Amethyst by Luke Turvey. It's a wonderful sci-fi opera. It's full of action. It's full of um, beautiful characters. Uh, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but if you like sci-fi, and if you li like action, and if you like a bit of love story, and if you like a bit of a secret, and uh, a bit of really everything you will enjoy this wonderful book thank you luke for writing this this great book thank you for <laughs> thank you for being here i appreciate your time and i appreciate uh your the in the interview you so kindly agreed to thank you very much of course thank you so much for having me here it's been awesome